Okay, hi everyone. Good morning. Thank you to the conference organizers for having me here today, for inviting Global Forest Watch to be part of the program here. I'm Liz Goldman. I'm the research manager for Global Forest Watch. And as many of you know, Global Forest Watch is a forest monitoring initiative that is celebrating its 10 year anniversary this year. And I've been with Global Forest Watch much of those 10 years, so wanted to take some time today to reflect on the initiative, how we started, some key ways that we've managed to drive impact over the years, kind of sticking with the theme of the conference of data to impact, data to policy, and then talk a little bit about where we're going next. So to start, I want to take us back before Global Forest Watch. You know, th these are the earlier days when much of the world's um, forest information was in static maps, PDF downloads of statistics, and with the exception of a few places, a few countries like Brazil comes to mind who had and continues to have just the gold standard of forest monitoring systems and capabilities through PROTUS, much of the world um, had limited access to forest information. The, the information was really lacking. It was often you know, found in dispersed reports like we see here, a lot of these are WRI reports. Um, the information there may or may not be comparable. They might be using different definitions of forests, different um, types of loss measurements. The information was often out of date. It was maybe a couple of years out of date, a couple of decades out of date. Um, there was limited scales of information available. Um, so oftentimes information was available at the country level. There was limited subnational information available. And oftentimes it was expensive to access, just too technical for the average person to understand and hard to build a shared consensus around um, what was happening with the world's forests. And the situation made it hard. It made it hard for key actors to do their work. It made it hard for governments. It impeded informed policymaking, law enforcement, public participation. Sometimes the situation facilitated corruption, too. Um, it also made the work of companies harder, too. It was just yet another obstacle in the way of demonstrating success and progress toward sustainability commitments that were being made. So with this context and this background in mind, in 2014 is when we launched Global Forest Watch. This is the picture from the launch of the initiative. And for those of you who've worked with WRI staff might recognize some faces in the, in the crowd there. Um, but this is really the work and culmination of a lot of time and effort from WRI staff, from our partners, um, shopping this proposal around to some of the donors that have fun funded our initiative initially and over the years with the idea that we needed a paradigm shift for how the world got its forest information. And by having better information, we could actually do something to combat the very real problem we're still facing with tropical deforestation and all of the impacts that it has on um, nature, people, and climate. And what this initiative tried to do um, was harness the revolution of global satellite monitoring to create groundbreaking data about forests and then make it accessible to anyone, anywhere through our online and now offline tools that we have available so that people were empowered to make better decisions about the world's forests, whether they were managing an indigenous territory, monitoring an oil palm sourcing area, or a philanthropic portfolio, they could now do it with Global Forest Watch. And today, millions of people are accessing the Global Forest Watch platform, and hundreds of millions of people are hearing about how forests are changing through all of the communications work that we do around the data each year. But it, always, it wasn't always like this, and I think it's easy for me to stand here after 10 years and talk about our success stories and accolades, and trust me, I'm going to do that a little bit. But um, it's been humbling, I think, to face the many challenges that our, our initiative has faced over the years and some of the um, you know, deserved criticisms that we've heard over the years as well. And to ground us a little bit, I wanted to... Um, share a graphic that I think is helpful to explain the trajectory of our initiative. So this is the Gartner hype cycle graph. Some of you might be familiar with this. 
It's a way of explaining the course that technology can take through time. So on the y-axis, we have visibility or hype. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have time. And just to explain this through the lens of Global Forest Watch, we can see that initially there's some sort of technology trigger. There's some new invention, some exciting new thing happens. In our case, it was this new global forest monitoring data set was published. We quickly go up to a peak of inflated expectations. This is the key. This is what has been missing. This is what we need to solve deforestation. It's better access to information. But then quickly we fall into the trough of disillusionment. We start hearing criticisms, many of which well deserved. You don't monitor forests. You actually only monitor tree cover. And you're only talking about tree cover loss, not forest loss, let alone deforestation. You are defining and reporting on country-level information? What gives you the right to do that? Only country governments should be able to do that. You're not even talking about net change. You don't have anything about gain. You're only telling one side of the story. These are all very well-deserved, <laughs> I think, points that people made to us over the years. And slowly, though, I think through conversation, through dialogue, through improved technical documentation, through data set improvements, we climb onto the slope of enlightenment, we do better, and we go onto the plateau of productivity. I don't think this fully captures the story of Global Forest Watch, though, because I take issue especially with the plateau of productivity. It sort of implies the steady state that we're on, that we're kind of coasting and everything is stable and fine. But in reality, I think this is kind of how our initiative has gone over the years. There's been a lot of ups and downs, and this is just the kind of the, the nature of a slightly older initiative, a longer term initiative, where we have, you know, beyond the plateau, we have highs of a new data set that was published, and we can unlock a new way of talking about forests and reporting on changes in forests. We have a low because there's some sort of miscommunication about the data, and we have to figure out why that happened and issue corrections. We have another high when there's a favorable political administration elected into office in a key country, and it just unlocks potential and new doors for what we could do with our work, and declines again because the Hansen data is showing the opposite trend compared to a, you know, a key forest monitoring system in an important country that we work in a lot. So lots of highs and lows, but my personal opinion is that the overall trajectory is upward. I think we've learned a lot in our 10 years, and I want to spend the rest of the talk explaining the way that we've kind of honed our, our work into areas where we can have impact, where we have a unique offer for our community and how we can be of use. And there are these three themes. The first one is shaping the discourse on how forests are changing, um, across the world. The second is strengthening local monitoring capabilities on the ground. And the third is enabling ambition and accountability for corporate commitments. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about these three areas and where I think we're going next with them. Um, so to start, this is perhaps what Global Forest Watch is best known for, depending on how you've worked with us and our data over the years. This serving our shared understanding about what's happening in the world's forests. Um, this largely relies on the annual data from the University of Maryland, the tree cover loss product, which we've been supporting since the beginning of the initiative. Every year we put out a new year of data on tree cover loss and we are providing an accepted starting point for many international conversations that are talking about deforestation. Our graphs and statistics get referenced quite a bit in these. And you know, the data was first released in 2013 with annual updates thereafter. And we have also taken great strides over the past decade to fill critical data gaps and provide increasingly policy relevant information. And I don't think it's a coincidence that during that time as well, some of the biggest commitments and achievements when it comes to tropical deforestation actually coincide with our ability to monitor um, openly and transparently forests and provide this more policy relevant information to people. 
And I think some of the improvements that we've made over the years can actually be seen in our communications materials. So this is from an earlier release in um, covering the 2015 data. And you can see we're talking about tree cover loss. You know, this is a biophysical measure. It includes loss of all types of tree cover, be it um, tree crops, you know, older oil palm plantations being cut down. Those get picked up by the satellites, um, by the algorithm. Um, loss within planted forest, you know, timber harvesting, but also loss in secondary and primary forests as well. It's all lumped together. And, you know, people may or may not have found this information very useful when we were first publishing this data. But slowly over time, we've been able to introduce new data sets through our research partnerships. Um, we can see from the 2021 data release, we now have information on primary forests. So we can hone in on loss within forests that are um, more important for biodiversity, for carbon storage. And we now have an important driver information too. We can disaggregate the loss into loss due to fire and other drivers. And as we all know, forest fires are becoming a, an increasingly important driver and phenomenon that's happening in forests all across the world. That's something that we can now monitor and keep track of better. Um, also in 2021, we released the Global Forest Review. This is a peer-reviewed document that um, is updated regularly. It has 18 indicators of um, forest, uh, forest-related um, topics and includes the annual release information as well. And I think this was an important step for us too because we were starting to realize that it's not enough to just publish the data. We actually needed to frame it within um, certain themes and provide more insights to our users than just publishing the data and putting it out there. Um, and we've been able to you know, build on this as well. Um, last year we released, released the targets tracker on the Global Forest Review where we are again taking the data and putting it into a policy lens, filtering down what is a broad data set of tree cover loss and determining a deforestation proxy and applying it to the Glasgow Leaders Declaration. Are we on track or not? We get this question all the time, and now we can apply the data to that question and answer it quite easily. Um, so these graphs are some of the communications materials that we put out every year for Global Forest Watch around the latest data from the University of Maryland. Um, the data gets picked up in the international press quite a bit, and also in local news outlets and in forested countries. Um, here we see a tweet from the European Commissioner, you know, referencing the data in their defense of the EUDR. So it gets quite a bit of traction every year. And one of the most exciting stories from our 2023 release, which we did earlier this year, um, was actually in India, which was not a country that we covered much in our materials or talked about much, but nevertheless, we saw the Indian Express released a, a piece looking at tree cover loss throughout the country. And then a month later, the National Green Tribunal, which is India's highest environmental court, actually took this up as a case and asked its own government to explain loss of forest cover in the country. This is an ongoing case that we are tracking. And, you know, it's not just the communications materials that we prepare every year. We find that journalists are actually picking up Global Forest Watch tools and using them for their reporting. So we see here from Morgan Erickson Davis, senior editor for Manga Bay Environmental News Outlet, saying, I'm not speaking hyperbolically when I say Global Forest Watch is the most powerful tool in my reporting and editing kit. I use it every day, and most of the hundreds of stories I've produced over the past decade would not have been possible without it. So where are we going next? Um, I think there's more and more data on forests available all the time with artificial intelligence, which we just heard a um, compelling talk this morning about this. Um, it, the trend is only going to keep going. It's just easier and easier to make a map. And instead of driving Global Forest Watch out of the picture, I think, what we're actually seeing is increased demand for our expertise in making sense of all of the different data sets and new things that are coming online. Um, I think we have a big role to play as a reliable source of information, helping people navigate the complexity of all these data sets. And that means keeping up our existing data sets while also 
ushering in the new era of monitoring capabilities. So as someone on the research team following all these data sets, I'm very excited to see where we go in the coming years in this space. Um, GFW's second strategy is all about making forest monitoring accessible on the ground. When we first launched Global Forest Watch in 2014, we talked about globally consistent data, but locally relevant information. And I think that was kind of aspirational at the time, to be honest. Um, you know, GFW's um, near real-time alerts were first published in 2016, so a couple of years later. And it wasn't really until that happened that we started to see this more um, local interest in the, in the data and using it on the ground. Here we see RAD alerts that are published by Wageningen University, um, who's here today also, and they have a talk later that you should check out. Um, this shows logging road expansion in Central African Republic, and it's this type of data on Global Forest Watch that actually allows users to track um, expanding deforestation in near real time and create credible evidence of its spread. So, and, and for us, you know, it's not just about the data, which is of course a, a key part of this, but our role here is about outreach, training, and finding funding to make all of this a reality. So, um, just to give an example, we've been working some t for some time now with the Rainforest Foundation US to bring GFW data and tools to indigenous forest monitors in Peru. Um, who use this information to make their patrols more efficient and to make formal legal complaints when necessary. And it quickly became known that these communities were actively monitoring their lands. And in fact, the community patrols were so effective that they became known as forest guardians for, by the neighboring national park. And since then, Rainforest Foundation US has actually gone on to scale that work as part of a randomized control trial with 76 indigenous communities, and they found that communities that actually implemented these forest monitoring protocols were able to reduce deforestation by 52% in the first year and by an additional 21% in the second year. And since then, this model has spread across Peru, and now there are several indigenous forest monitoring hubs throughout the country, so we've been able to scale this work. Um, another way that we've also evaluated our impact is through um, a study in which we used monitoring subscription data that we collect on Global Forest Watch. Um, when you go to the platform, you can create a profile and subscribe to different polygons and areas to um, actively monitor forests uh, around the world. And so we used this information, figuring out which ones were actually actively monitored versus somebody set up an alert or at a subscription one time and, and never checked it. And you know, we found out that um, there was actually a statistically significant reduction of deforestation in Africa um, from people who were actively monitoring the forest there. We evaluated South America, Africa, and Southeast Asian regions. And we found that the effect actually grows stronger the longer people have been able to access the alerts. And we were really excited about this result. You know, when we first um, went about this study, we had no idea what we were gonna find. We were a little worried that we wouldn't find anything. Um, and we did find a statistically significant result in Africa. That did beg the question, why not South America and Southeast Asia? And our theories are that either we checked too soon um, in some places, the alerts had only been available for one or two years, and so it's possible that there just wasn't this information available for long enough to show an impact in the data yet. And the other theory is that, um, you know, it's possible that, you know, in South America, there's already robust information in certain places, like I mentioned before. Um, in Southeast Asia, there's already um, a pretty strong enforcement protocol in certain places, and so the alerts just didn't have as big of an impact in these places compared to um, countries in Africa where there's just limited information and limited resources where being able to prioritize patrols and response to deforestation had a much bigger impact there. So um, we'll see. I think it would be very interesting to repeat this study, and, um, and it's just you know, another way that we've been able to measure the impact of our work. 
um, outside of indigenous and community monitoring. Another example of local, lo more local use case I wanted to mention briefly is that we've seen GFW data be used um, in forest reference emission level reporting by certain countries. So few countries are using it right off the shelf and that's, that's fine, but we see that 53% of countries are using it in some way, mostly to QC their, their reporting, but it's just another way that um, we're seeing GFW uptake in a more local, um, uh, local way. So what's next um, for strengthening local monitoring? Well, I think we've seen a tremendous strengthening of forest monitoring systems across the tropics in the past decade. GFW has played a role in this in some way, and I think you know, we want to continue applying a combination of pressure and support to make government systems even more robust, transparent, where needed. But I do think that the big gap is not necessarily in our ability to monitor these systems and data. Um, it's, it's more in building capacity of local actors, so governments, civil society organizations, to use the data to inform um, decisions and when to take action on the ground. And that's where the rubber really meets the road. Um, GFW has demonstrated the power of enabling local actors, and so I think our job in the coming years is to continue to scale, make partnerships with others working in this space so that they can use the best tools for the local context um, to actually make an impact on, on local deforestation. Okay, and the final strategy or area that GFW is trying to drive impact is, has been on, around the movement for deforestation and now conversion-free supply chains. Um, one way that GFW has worked in this space over the years is by helping companies monitor their commitments and portfolios of, of um, spatial supply chain information. And we do this through a related um, application called Global Forest Watch Pro. It's really most of the same data that's on um, Global Forest Watch, but applied in a corporate context. We have information about risk, um, portfolios, or lists of information that they can use, um, and then other features like business-to-business -business sharing and, and things like that that just help them do their job of, of monitoring their supply chain. Um, but of course, this space is getting increasingly crowded, we have found. It seems like there is a new supply chain monitoring company um, co coming up every week, all with proprietary data that's behind a paywall. Um, and yet, I think WRI and Global Forest Watch still has an important role to play here because we are at a unique situation where we are following the latest research and data, but also we have engagement staff that are plugged into some of the conversations around setting um, some of the regulatory commitments and voluntary commitments like through the accountability framework initiative. And we are working directly with the companies, building relationships with them to help them understand this increasingly complex landscape. Um, I think, you know, it's not enough to just monitor the commitments once they're met too. Another way that we've seen the data used is through advocacy organizations. So, here we see Mighty Earth, Global Witness, actually using the Global Forest Watch data to call out companies for deforestation in their supply chain. Um, in this case, it was Cargill. Um, so, so reporting on this using our data. And then at the same time, we see Cargill stepping up, raising their ambition to make a commitment to eliminate deforestation and conversion from its supply chain in three countries and they actually approached us to help them monitor this commitment, just building on our, our decade of ex expertise in this space. So, what's next? Um, you know, I think the deforestation conversion-free agenda is kind of reaching a peak of political momentum right now, right? With impending UDR, other demand-side regulations coming into play, while at the same time, companies are under more pressure than ever to actually deliver on DCF, net zero, nature positive. They're just swimming in standards, requirements, data providers, tool providers, and we're kind of in this sink or swim moment, I think, will, where we're all asking ourselves, will we actually hit these 2030 targets or are we gonna be disappointed again? 
like we were in 2020. Um, for GFW's own role, I think that we have a critical role to play here as a benchmark with public data. Again, there's a lot of companies with proprietary data, but we, our, our whole um, goal is to make public data available that anyone can use for free. And so we are going to continue to do that, helping people um, navigate this complex space and providing an influential voice and in setting some of the best practices here. So with that, I wanted to just end with a couple of final reflections after you know, working on the initiative for about 10 years now. Um, I think something that I'm very proud of with Global Forest Watch is that we've had this real measurable impact on reducing deforestation, and we've taken the time to actually study this and measure it, which is, um, it's easy to kind of pick out um, stories and share them, but we've actually studied this, and, and um, that takes its own dedica dedicated resources and time to do that. Um, the other thing that we've realized is that operational monitoring is never done, right? There's always new technology coming around the corner. Um, there's always a changing political climate that, sh that shifts things. And that also takes a lot of dedicated time and resources to stay at the forefront of new tech and new, um, new policies and, and a, just a changing dynamic um, world that we live in. And the final thing is that I think data are necessary. Um, they're critical, really. Um, but it's not always sufficient to drive impact. The more that we can take the data and bring it to the policies that we're trying to support, the questions that we anticipate people are trying to answer, um, the better, because people have limited attention spans, time, resources, and so the more we can help anticipate what these needs are and offer easy answers, easy solutions, the more we'll be able to drive um, impact at the end of the day. So with that, um, thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to discussing Global Forest Watch, um, co potential collaborations, and hearing from you all in the coming days. Thanks so much.